Okay, so I should start. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry to correct you. I'm not yet a PhD candidate. I just finished oh. uh, my master's. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, today we'll briefly present you uh, the main conclusions of my MA thesis, during which I have tried to apply the social network analysis method on uh, Michael Fognati's letters. Uh, first and foremost, I think that I should do a brief definition of uh, social networks. So a social network is a set of actors, in our case, individuals and the relations such as friendship, communication or advice that connect them. Uh, in order to analyze a social network, one has to firstly conduct the prosopographical study of its members Secondly, to identify the connections between them. And finally, to integrate these findings in a specific social and uh, geographic context. The objective of such an analysis is the identification and exploration of the common patterns on which the social structures are based. Uh, even though social network analysis has started as a sociological and anthropological method, it has been acknowledged as a potent tool for historians as well. Uh, the analysis of a historical network can lead to uh, the discovery. Uh, can you see this thing on the screen? Oh, yes. In the first part. OK. Um, so uh, as you were saying, um, the analysis of a historical network can lead to the discovery of new themes or conclusions through the study of, an individu of individual people or uh, groups. These new approaches are contextualized in uh, a larger scale. They can offer new explanation for historical facts or phenomena. Uh, naturally, analyzing a historical network, and especially a Byzantine one, bears certain dangers, uh, such as the lack of evidence uh, due to the lack of sources. However, it should be noted that the application of sociological methodologies does not create these problems, but it rather highlights them. Uh, it has been supported that the 12th century has a lot of potential regarding social network analysis due to the extensive spread of certain social concepts and practices, such as patronage and spiritual kinship. Moreover, letter collections have been considered as the most appropriate and uh, user-friendly source for approaching Byzantine networks. Thus, Michael Fognates' letter collection is a relatively safe starting point for the study of the 12th century networks, not only due to its practical size and chronological extent, but also uh, because of the multiple eponymous recipients of his. The year 1204, which is the uh, chronological limit of my research so far, is not um, a, a fictitious historical periodization. The siege of Constantinople and the conquest of Greece resulted as a natural changing point for Michael Honiatis' network. Except from uh, the direct outcomes of the siege, such as uh, the disintegration of power centers, the emerge of a new dynasty, um, the disappearance of certain people, and some other factors, such as uh, the natural death, deaths of a Stathios generation, uh, the most important reason for this chronological limit is the change of the main objective of uh, Michael Fognatis' networking, the upgrade of his diocese, Athens, which he had lost to the Crusaders. Um, so in the first section of my presentation, I will concisely go through the technical details and the actual analysis of Michael's network. So Michael Honiatis' network is examined as an egocentric one, the focus of which is the relations that he had with each person. The recipients and the people mentioned in his letters have been classified in, on, in order of intimacy to Michael. They have been grouped in two orders and four zones of intimacy inspired by Margaret Mallet's uh, model. 
the criteria for their classification are primarily the nature of their relationship with Michael and the feelings that he expresses for them. Uh, the above are taken into account with uh, other factors, such as the frequency and duration of communication and the degree of reciprocity. The aim is to highlight the common patterns that characterize the members of its proximity zone. So a person's closest relatives and most beloved friends are called personal self. The major similarity among the members of Michael's personal self is that all of them have been highly educated. Although only four of them can be safely characterized as traditional scholars, these men had been associated with the Patriarchal School of Constantinople, in which they got acquainted with Michael as his teachers, his classmates, and some of them as his own private students. Uh, moving on to the second the network, or the, uh, the intimate zone, uh, the boundaries between true friendship and self-interest under the disguise of friendly manners become more blurred. Most of them were powerful officials of the capital from whom Michael Honiatis was trying to gain benefits for his metropolis. It is not known if they had all coexisted in, coexisted in the same educational circles at uh, the point, but it is clear that higher education remains the common denominator of the members of this category. Some of them were closely connected with the Nikitas as well, making their relationship with Michael a clique and not just a diad. In the affective zone, the emotional factor completely recedes as the main reason that Michael communicated with his people was practical interest. In addition, trivial uh, issues of the everyday life emerge as a reason for writing letters. Although education does not seem to disappear as a common feature of the members of this zone, it did not play a decisive uh, role in their relationship with Michael. The majority of these men are associated with uh, Constantinople, while the percentage that came exclusively from Greece continues to be uh, relatively small and consists mainly of priests and monks. The last category of the first order uh, is the nominal zone, which includes people who Michael knew, but, he did, but they did not play any significant role in his life. Finally, the people who were directly inaccessible for Michael are included in the extended zone of the network. So uh, based on the data resulting from this process, two issues have been highlighted and re-examined. As it has been already noted, the main link between the members of the network was education. Michael Honiates' letters offer a foundation for the study of social patterns that coexisted under the veil of the patriarchal school. Uh, secondly, we are going to uh, explore the political and social background that led a specific group of scholars to take over provincial metropolises during uh, Manuel Comnenos' reign. So uh, after all these uh, technicalities, we are moving on to the second section of this presentation, the social dimension of education and the evolution of the scholarly elite. Before moving forward, I should define uh, two things in order to get my message across. Uh, first, what is pedia? And second, what I mean when I say literati. Uh, so, pedia is above all a cultural act that takes place in a specific geographical and social context. Uh, for the sake of cohesion, during my research, I perceived as a literatus whomever Michael considered to be at least intellectually equal to himself. Of course, this is a choice that facilitates this specific research and it should not be perceived as an attempt to create a new definition of Byzantine scholars. So uh, most of Michael Konyatis' most potent recipients were either his teachers, his peers, and some of them his students. Uh, the networking that took place in the Patriarchal School of Constantinople was decisive for their lives. Unfortunately, the analysis of the 12th century Byzantine networks cannot offer new information about the process of learning, since most of the literatist letters were written long after the pupillage. 
However, this uh, methodology can cast a new light on the spiritual trends of the era and the influence not only on education, but also on politics, economy, and uh, society in general. Uh, so, the analysis of Michael Honiates' uh, network highlights the cases of men who, although were not of noble origin, not, relate, not related to the imperial family, managed to rise to powerful positions and receive titles. Clearly, the reason for the rise was higher education, which, of course, had always provided the state with uh, capable officials. Um, I, sh uh, I should note here that we're not talking about only about uh, individuals, but also for entire families which have gained the power to promote their friends or relatives to similar positions. Belisariotes' family is a fine example because they held power and titles for almost three decades and they were highly respected without ever being related to nobility. Additionally, the cases of Furnitarios and Disipatos families should be noted. However, blood relatives uh, were on, are only the one side of this coin. On the other side, we can observe people who uh, acted like they were related, even though they were not. It might be the case that a different kind of uh, nepotism had gained uh, popularity, which uh, was in a way the opposing force of the imperial nepotism. And this was a uh, spiritual kinship. But who were spiritual relatives? Spiritual relatives were, of course, of course, considered the teachers and their students with whom they could obtain lifelong relationships. However, in contrast to the West, teachers in Byzantium did not seem to be the strongest factor of the dipole, as not only were they expendable in the eyes of their students, but their professional growth depended directly on their pupils' success. In addition, in the known cases, the communication between them was interrupted on uh, the students' initiative. For instance, it was uh, Michael Aftorianos who decided to stop writing to Estatios after his professional rise. Additionally, it was George Padiatis who did not answer his rather emotional and uh, sometimes overly assertive teacher, Michael Honiates. Uh, a question that remains unanswered to me is uh, if Michael himself has stopped writing to Estathios some point after the siege of Thessalonica, since there is no evidence of communication between them during the last decade of Estathios' life. So I think that the idea that the strongest expression of spiritual, of spiritual kinship was the relationship among the peers, at least for uh, the late 12th century Byzantines should be uh, entertained. From the love and respect that Malakas had for his spiritual father and peer, Estathios, to the parallel lives that Michael Konyates and Aftorianos had led, resulting in uh, even deliberately choosing the same name, and the comparison of Ioannis Belisariotis and Nikitas Konyates with Orestes and Pilates and the Siamese Molionis, it seems that the relations between the students were more long-lived and stronger than those with the teachers. Supporting uh, this hypothesis is the fact that the dreams and aspiration of scholars seems to have uh, changed from uh, the one generation to uh, the other. Estatheos' generation began envisioning a life near the imperial court uh, where they enjoyed the protection of patrons and a career first in the patriarchal school and then on uh, provincial metropolitan thrones. Um, Michael Konyates' generation seems to have had a, compl a completely different attitude. Uh, during the Angelos dynasty, the number of uh, celebrated and successful didascali was uh, dramatically smaller than during the communist reign. The scholars' tendency to adapt their work to the preferences of the emperors and the, their patrons seems to have repelled Michael's generation from working in the patriarchal school. Even the expectation of ordination in provincial metropolises seems to have begun to fade in the eyes of some scholars who preferred to remain in the capital. But uh, the practical benefits of higher education were not exclusively confined within the capital. As it will be discussed uh, in a while, 
one of the basic criteria of appointing provincial metropolitans was their uh, education. In fact, the metropolitans themselves held the belief that their education was the most important factor of their success. Uh, this might initially seem as an um, elaborate uh, rhetorical scheme which they devised in order to um, encourage each other, but uh, if it is approached in a pragmatic manner, it could clarify the true value that Pavia held for these men. Uh, so, the usefulness of Pavia for the Metropolitan can be broken down into components rhetorical skills and knowledge of agriculture. Uh, first, rhetorical mastery was a metropolitan tool, tool for consolidating their position in their local communities and for reaping benefits from power uh, officials of the capital. Uh, knowledge of agriculture, on the other hand, derived uh, both from experience and agricultural literature, which flourished at the time, enable them to effectively manage ecclesiastical lands and increase the income of their dioceses. Uh, it has been observed that in contrast to the West, the Byzantine educational institutions were concentrated exclusively in Constantinople. However, the move of eminent scholars to provincial metro metropolitan thrones transmitted the spiritual tendencies of the capital there. Uh, not only did they have their own students who followed them, but they also gathered local students around them. In addition, they created libraries, which were an important intellectual and financial capital for the urban centers. Moreover, uh, there is a possibility of uh, a new production of books that has started in Greece, since not only there were books that were written there under their supervision, such as uh, Codex uh, Labredinianus 8.12, but also there was an interest from Constantinopolitans to copy the literary work of those men. If these facts are combined uh, with the hypothesis that the scholars of Phoniates' generation consciously abstained from the organized education of the capital, then the beginning of a Byzantine educational multicentricity can be effectively traced. 1204 put an abrupt end to these changes that had just begun to take place. Uh, now to the third and last section, uh, the appointment of uh, metropolitans since the mid 12th century. Um, it has been observed that the role of the metropolitans during the 12th century had certain characteristics that extended beyond their pastoral duties. Firstly, increasing the productivity of ecclesiastical lands seems to have been perhaps the most important criterion for their success. In addition, the metropolitans took on the responsibility of maintaining imperial power in the provinces, often being forced to uh, completely replace it. However, the common characteristics uh, of these men are not limited to their work as metropolitans. The majority of the well-known provincial metropolitans of the time had previous service in the Patriarchate or uh, the clergy of Hagia Sophia, had served as imperial orators, came from prominent families or were wards or uh, relatives, usually nephews of patriarchs and metropolitans, and of course were highly educated. But perhaps the most uh, striking common feature that uh, they was that uh, they most probably knew each other through the patriarchal school, having uh, been classmates, teachers, students, while some of them seem to ma have maintained uh, lifelong relationships. So um, what was it that led these scholars to abandon their careers in the capital for provincial metropolitan thrones from the mid 12th century? For me, the answer is a political initiative. The Comnenian dynasty established the church as an active part of the administrative mechanism. This tactic did not only concern the capital, but also the provincial administration. As for uh, Asia Minor, Manuel I Komnenos took measures to support the metropolitans of Muslim occupied cities, but uh, Manuel's reforms for Greece were more discreet, uh, but equally as important. By a Chrysobul of uh, 1148, Manuel I issued concession to all the metropolises of the empire. 
These privileges have been characterized by Magdaleno as a gift to the cities themselves and not just to the local churches. Uh, Manuel had left the bishops free to manage the ecclesiastical properties, but in reality, he minimized uh, the imperial control only to implement it again through different means that would attempt to change the provincial life from the ground up. In other words, Manuel set the metropolitans as agents of the reconstruction of the areas affected by Roger II's invasions and uh, beyond. Um, however, reading the metropolitans' view about their own role as they shared it among themselves, imperial intervention is uh, completely absent as a factor of shaping their goals. While it seems that not only the upgrading of the cities, but even the appointment uh, to metropolitan thrones had become a personal affair of the Stathios' friends and students. Besides, they seem to have supported each other to achieve their goal. For example, uh, Michael Fognatis had collaborated with Malakis in order to uh, reform uh, the monastic life and had also asked Stathios' intervention for an unknown matter. Uh, for his metropolis. Moreover, they exchanged agricultural books and technological practices, as it is demonstrated uh, from the cases of Boradiotes and uh, Epiphanius of Verdicchi and Perstera. So, if we combine the above information, uh, the second and less obvious part of Manuel's policy for Greece is revealed. The new privileges had to fall into the right hands to make the most out of it without being undermined by the local spirit that characterized some urban centers. Suitable carriers of these reforms were none other than the scholars who had rallied around him, fully shared his views on society, and had been the voices of imperial propaganda in the capital for decades. Undoubtedly, Estatios' circle met all these conditions. The appointment to provincial metropolises became the goal uh, of the scholars, for which some uh, of them had been preparing since their youth. Unlike Manuel, Andronikos focused on consolidating the local provincial administration, changing the criteria for selecting uh, pretors. During his reign, the rulers of Greece and the Peloponnese were the most effective ones in the last decades of the century. Additionally, uh, Michael's network as a whole, experienced a period of uh, disgrace, which was mostly initiated by uh, the Patriarch Theodosius Voradiotis' resignation and the Tornikis and Malakias family dispute with Andronikos, uh, with, of course, some exception like uh, Theodoros Mazzoukis. Uh, Isaac II briefly revived Manuel's tactics, establishing five or six new metropolitan seats in Greece often based on economic uh, rather than on um, population criteria. In addition, he intervened in matters of electing uh, bishops, took care of securing the ecclesiastical lands after the death of uh, the metropolitans, and gave control over the Staphorpigial monasteries to the metropolitans. Alexius III seems to have abandoned any attempt to upgrade the provincial cities. This fact should not be attributed entirely to his uh, indifference. It should be borne in mind that during his reign, the problems that had led the uh, Greek urban centers to decline by the middle of the century had almost been uh, eliminated. And despite the claims of the metropolitans, it seems that the cities have experienced economic and social growth with uh, the exception of uh, the issue of piracy. Uh, Alexios's ineffectiveness lies in his inability to protect the provinces from the new problems that had arisen or uh, worsened in his days, mainly from the increased taxation and the local uh, insurgents. Uh, now we are going to close with some general conclusions. So before 1204, Michael Fognatis corresponded, Michael Fognatis corresponded only with uh, men. Most of them were probably almost his age, while the percentage of elders must have been uh, smaller than the one of the younger people, but we can't be sure about that. Um, Constantinople was the most frequent destination of his letters. The number of ladies slightly exceeds the number of the clergy. 
only four of his recipients were numbers of the imperial family, while eight, uh, 18 people are mentioned in the historiographical work of uh, Nikitas. Thus, it can be said that uh, Michael Konyates' average recipient was a middle-aged high official who lived in Constantinople. Um, the main goal of writing letters uh, was the economic rate of Athens. At the second level, there were some mediations in favor of certain people. The evaluation of the effectiveness of the network lies in the investigation of the economic and social condition uh, of Athens under Michael Konyatis, which uh, maybe is a matter of a uh, whole other research. But undoubtedly, the network has been very effective as an uh, information web. In addition, through the analysis of uh, Michael's network, uh, a small contribution to the prosopographical research of the 12th century has been uh, achieved. Um, through Michael Konyat's network, the catalytic role of education in the administration and the church during the second half of the 12th century is highlighted. Scholars were close to the emperors as orators, as officials, but also as advisors, had strong connection with the aristocracy, whether they belonged to it or not, gained the power to promote people close to them in high positions, and enjoyed professional success both in the capital uh, and in the provinces. Networking in the patriarchal school, which is embedded in the broader uh, term of uh, philia, friendship, seems to have been a privilege, perhaps uh, um, as important as the nobility of blood. Um, the common features of most well-known metropolitans of the second half of the 12th century uh, were not a result of uh, coincidences or conjectures, but a voluntary derivative of the scholar's ideology under Manuel the First Comnenos. The perception of the role and the work they demonstrated is compliance with Manuel's views and practices for upgrading the provinces. Uh, in conclusion, from the middle of the 12th century, the metropolitans were for the state an easy and inexpensive solution for upgrading uh, the provincial cities and the maintenance of the imperial power over them. Uh, the new model of sainthood that appeared in Greece in the beginning of the 13th century, in my opinion, proves the efficacy of uh, Manuel's policy. Saint Eustathius of Thessalonica, Saint Ioannis Kalokdenis, the patron saint, Saint of Thebes, and Saint Michael Honiates left behind them a legacy that turned them a place in the hearts of their flocks. Um, in my opinion, Martin Honiates' corpus of letters should not be regarded as a collage of fragmented information, randomly scattered out of their, release, their initial order, but as a coherent piece of literature with a specific narration that was, uh, of course, created by um, the posterior copiers of his work. This narration depicts Michael, not as a student, teacher, or even as a scholar, but as a metropolitan who is sainthood through his actions for Athens. Uh, lastly, Michael Konyatis should not be considered as a model metropolitan of his time, but as a final and perhaps the most perfect product of the political and intellectual background of the second half of the 12th century. Um, thank you for your, att your attention. I also have attached some bibliography if anybody's interested. Uh, thank you, Ms. Black. It was very interesting, your, uh, your you. paper. Uh, just a little remark uh, uh, concerning F. Statius Thessaloniki, you know that it was not saint. Uh, he took the sainthood just uh, in the uh, 20th century, uh, uh, Statius remained non saint, uh, even if we, even uh, also we have yeah. portraits of him as a saint during the 40th century. But uh, uh, he has been canonized uh, by the church uh, uh, in, in 20th century. Mm -hmm. This remains a very crazy and enigmatic. Thank you for your remark. I just added him, added him to the list because. Uh, 
there were these uh, rumors about the miracles that his yes. uh, remains performed, and also he was depicted as a saint. So I yes, you are right. Only me. They say that he was considered a local saint on a local level, yes. and then he, uh, mm -hmm. before he was uh, officially at, canonized. Yes. So okay, that's the reason you. I put him. But you're completely right about that. Uh, if there are other questions or uh, discussion for this very interesting uh, paper of Ms. Um, yes. I would... uh, if I could ask something, sorry, uh, do we have time? Yes, I think. Okay, uh, Mrs. Vlaku, first of all, congratulations for your presentation. It was uh, really interesting. Uh, I would like to ask you about I'm sorry, I cannot hear. A, a reference. Uh, can you hear me clearly? I'm sorry. Do you hear me, do you hear me clearly? I would like to ask me. Yes. Um, I would like to ask about the established libraries Do we that you uh, mentioned. Do we have um, uh, information about this in uh, the Byzantine province? I, couldn't, I didn't uh, underst understand it uh, well. That's why. Um, we don't have any exact information about their contents or what they, uh, what which books they bring uh, along them from Constantinople. But mm -hmm. for example, for Michael Fognati, we know that he had a library, uh, and he was uh, exceptionally sad because uh, he uh, left his library behind when he left Athens, and it was destroyed mm -hmm. by the Crusaders. Mm -hmm. So this is more based on um, this kind of evidence. There is no evidence about how many books or uh, when did they acquire them. Also mm -hmm. about the uh, agricultural literature, we know that uh, Michael Honiatis has asked the patriarch, the ex then patriarch, Theodosius Boradiotes for uh, a Georgikon. Mm -hmm. And okay. later in his life, he started collecting medical books uh, because he uh, had um, fallen really ill and he wanted to find a way to treat himself somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank and you. about the uh, Laventinianus, because this, I think this was a part of the whole book library's theme, uh, it was created under the seal of Ioannis Christantos at the mm -hmm. end of the 12th century in Thessalonica by uh, a scribe named uh, Jacobus. Mm -hmm. I hope yeah. I, I tried to answer. <laughs> 